Hello and welcome to another episode of Come Back Stronger where we bring you stories from around the world of people who have overcome adversity, injuries, obstacles, and setbacks and have come back stronger. <laughs> I'm here with my law partner, Dana Brooks, Hi and there. we are going to introduce you today to Vivian Niebel, who oh, is lovely. a very, very interesting person. One of the things about uh, Vivian that I like is that I like talking to people that are a little advanced in age because they mm -hmm. have so mm -hmm. much mm -hmm. wisdom yeah, to now, share. You wouldn't know that from her because she's, she's 80 or, or in her 80s, but um, she's just she's a lovely woman. She grew up and she's from Berlin. I uh, went through war-torn torn Berlin and immigrated with her family to uh, Canada and it's mm. just it's going to be a great story about her life and it's been made into uh, there's a documentary about it there's based a, on a book called there's an, a book and a documentary yeah, yeah. an unimportant girl and so she's going to tell you about that but she's just a very lovely person who's despite everything she's been through which is really unimaginable you know could, no, none of us alive right now can think about really growing up in a war situation but uh, yeah they really you know it's like the people in Ukraine it's happening right now today and it's, she lived through that it's so crazy to think mm -hmm. about the struggles and the trials that people have gone through and have overcome mm -hmm. and whenever you meet someone like that whenever I see someone like that I think wow this person has so much wisdom to share yeah yeah, yeah so it's very exciting we're gonna you're, you're gonna enjoy this story because not only not only did she go through the struggles, but when she came back, there's a, there's a typical mm -hmm. thing that we see in comeback stories, is that when she came back, one of the most critical elements to her comeback story is the love of her life. Yeah. And, and whenever we, it's always the, the people that we meet along the way, yes. a lot of times they can be that catalyst or that inspiration mm -hmm. that really pushes us to move forward and to be our, the best version of ourselves. Yeah. So that's the story that we've got coming for you. We're gonna go to a commercial break and when we come back we're going to introduce you to Vivian Niebel. This is about Carrie. It says, there's not enough space nor could I find enough words to articulate my experience with Face It Brooks. Working closely with Carrie and Brittany has literally changed my life. Not only did they handle my case as if they were standing up for their own immediate family, we became like family. I've never felt alone in the process. I never felt like just another case. And the encouragement on the harder days would always lift me up. Absolutely everyone in the firm exudes a compassion for the cases they handle and a real passion to empower the lives of individuals and families far beyond a settlement. They are strong, resilient, will leave no rock unturned, I absolutely love Facing Brooks. Aww. I love that. I mean, I just have no words to explain how grateful I am that somebody feels like that about us. Welcome back to Come Back Stronger, where we are introducing you to Vivian Niebel, who was born in Nazi Germany uh, to a single mother, and she had to she had to undergo the war poverty we're talking about hunger starvation yeah. it was she has quite a story we can't wait for you to see it stay tuned hi vivian thank you so much for joining us on the comeback stronger show today i can't wait for you to share your story with our audience about what it was like growing up as a little girl in berlin after it got completely demolished in world war ii and was under soviet occupation um, and then to where you are now so Let's jump right into it since we only have a couple minutes. Yes, thank you for having me, uh, Carrie, and uh, glad to share your story. Well, my story actually starts with the harsh realities of human life. You know, being born uh, during the war um, <clears throat> in the epicenter of Nazi Germany, Berlin. I was born in, as an illegitimate child and mm -hmm. therefore was given no nationality. So I was a girl without a country that was my first strike. Wow. And then growing up, you know, in the, I don't, actually do not remember the, the war itself, but the aftermath. All I remember was destruction <clears throat> and, uh, you know, that, uh, that city Berlin really mirrored its traumatized people. Not only were you a child growing up on the streets, an illegitimate child, without a country, without a father, in poverty, but you were also in the middle of Berlin. And I want people to understand that post-World War II Berlin had completely been demolished. So it's not just that you were growing up homeless, it's that you were growing up without even really a building to stay in because it had been completely destroyed, not only by the Nazis, but by the Americans and the Russians. 
uh, I did the go- the government provided an apartment in an ah. apartment for my mother and for my sister who was also illegitimate uh, so we did uh, grow up in an in an apartment that the government had uh, assigned to us and we had to share that with another couple mm. even though it was a small apartment because it was such a shortage of housing so I did have a roof over my head that's good you know, that's I good. did have oh, that but the hunger and cold was a constant and uh, so I actually mirrored this story in my book through my mother, you know, who kept us alive from falling bombs and Soviet attacks and who also worked the black market to keep us afloat, you know. So that is basically what it was, it was very tough. And at the age of uh, 13, uh, my mother um, immigrated to seek a better life to, to Canada. And uh, there, you know, I, I remember getting on the boat and saying to, saying to myself, you know, one day I will return successful. Mm-hmm. That I just manifested that already as a child when I was 13. It was because I always wanted to improve my station in life. Right. So when we arrived to Canada, we also experienced hunger once again the first winter because the man that my mother married, my stepfather, who was a custom tailor, could not find work. Mm-hmm. So we went hungry once again. And my mother was so, um, she was so resourceful. She took me by the hand. We walked into a church and we explained, you know, in that broken English, uh, the plight to our priest, to not our priest, it was just we just took a random church. And uh, the priest uh, listened and uh, sympathetically gave us $35 in order to survive. So my mother got the staples, you know, to keep us afloat. And then at the age of 14, I asked my mother if I could not help, you know, uh, with the family, help the family and uh, get a job. So she uh, obtained a special permit from the government because of that child labor law. And uh, and I got a job at a dentist at four uh, at fourteen uh, years old, right? At fourteen years old, and I assume that you weren't speaking English or French, right? You were probably just speaking German. By that time, I learned already Ger- English. Okay, I did my best at that uh, office, and uh, one day, uh, one of his uh, friends came in when the doctor was not there, and he sexually abused me. Oh, no. I was only fourteen. That was very tough for me to uh, deal with that. I told my mother and she said, you need to leave. So that's when I left and then uh, worked at a five and 10 cent store, Woolworth, uh-huh. behind the lunch counter, making sandwiches with care and heart. And uh, uh, I worked there and then I decided though I need to learn more. And I went to night school and learned typing and stenography and eventually landed the job at uh, the iconic dark car dealership Volkswagen sales and service, the Volkswagen. And uh, then uh, I worked up in an accounting department with uh, women, mostly women that were much older than I was, more than twice my age. There was no camaraderie, no connection at all. And I spiraled into deep depression. Hmm. And at uh, uh, age 17, I thought, you know, all my efforts are in vain. And I uh, thought to end my life. I had purchased already a small used car and uh, rented a, a garage in a duplex in Canada, in Montreal, that was in Montreal. And uh, I heard somewhere that when you close the garage door open oh, and start no. the motor that you will, that carbon monoxide would render you unconscious. And that is exactly what I did. Oh, no. I started the motor, had the garage doors closed, and all of a sudden a little girl appeared in front of me. And I thought, where did she come from, you know? And uh, she asked me, what are you doing? And I just said, I'm go- I immediately turned off the motor and opened the garage door and said, I'm going to wash my car. And then she disappeared. She was, she must have been uh, the daughter of the owner uh, of the duplex who rented the garage to me. Isn't that interesting? And she just happened that to is, appear at that time. It was miraculous. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. And I picked up a glimmer of hope and held on to that hope and returned to my life. I did my best. And uh, then eventually um, a position opened up downstairs at the customer service. And uh, since I knew how to type in stenography, they they gave me that job immediately as a secretary of the service manager. And at the eight, and I already felt 
better because I was among, you know, I saw life, people coming and going and I needed that. So it was already better. And then at the age of 20, the man walked in, he bought a Porsche and he became my husband. <laughs> From that time on, my whole life changed around because he was also a German immigrant mm -hmm. and uh, we married and he believed in me. And even though I was so insecure, I had so such little self-esteem, but he believed in me. He believed, saw the potential in me. He um, encouraged me to learn and grow. And uh, uh, I ran a marathon. He got me to run a marathon, even though I'm so stylish with my high heels. You know, <laughs> so different from, but it's amazing the many facets we have within ourselves. So I ran the marathon. Uh, he was going to buy a, a small plane, so he encouraged me to take flying lessons. I took that. I, I uh, soloed. You know, I did many things that I thought were not possible because I was uh, stuck in my self-limiting yeah. beliefs. I was in shackles still. Hey, Vivian, we've got to take a real quick break, but I am totally fascinated yeah. with your story. I've got a couple questions for you, so let's take a break, and then we'll come yes. right back. You know what I love about the story what? is that she manifested she, she decided did. that one day she's going to return successful yeah right and that to me is part of every comeback story is that the person that's going through the struggle has to have hope yeah you've got to have hope mm -hmm. you got to have a dream you got to mm -hmm. believe that it's possible yeah and she did but despite that she still ended up um ended up attempting to commit suicide. Right, right. Well, you know, you look at everything she's been through is she, she struggled something horrible in her homeland, has to, to um, relocate. And, you know, you're not talking about moving to a different neighborhood, a whole different, you know, country. And you're there and then you're, you're doing something that is really, you know, superhuman anymore, which mm -hmm. is going to work at as a 14 year old in a dental office. And then, you know, then she gets molested and all these sorts of things happen. And you just, you just think, gosh, what else does she have to take? Yeah. Have to, you beg for money for food and, and the sort of poverty she was living with in certain times. Um, so you, know, you, you wonder why more people don't really deal, deal with that. But she came so close. She didn't just have a plan. She was enacting the plan. And that little girl must just, I, I thought that's a divine intervention. Divine right intervention. Yeah. Well, he, at the, I think the important thing is that she saw it as divine yeah. intervention. She yeah. saw it as miraculous because yeah. she was ready to go. They, this was going to be the end mm -hmm. of her life. Yeah. And then here comes this little girl and she said, I picked up a glimmer of hope. Glimmer of That's hope. all you need. Yeah. A glimmer of hope to yeah. keep you going. Boy, and imagine if she hadn't done that. If she, if that little girl hadn't shown up, if she hadn't picked up that glimmer of hope, then she wouldn't be here today right. to tell her story that's going to inspire, that's already inspiring probably millions of people and it's going to inspire more as, mm -hmm. as time goes on. Yeah. Well, anyway, it's very Thank exciting. Goodness. We can't wait for you to hear the second part of the story. We're going to go to a commercial break and come back and hear the second part of her story. Excellent service. 100 times more responsive than other attorneys I've worked with. Highly recommend, especially attorney Kimmy Hogan. <laughs> she is fabulous. Yes, she is. <laughs> it's all about communication. The number one complaint about lawyers is my lawyer never calls me back. But the number two complaint is my lawyer never calls me and tells me what's happening with my case. That's why I love reading a review like this, because I know, Kimmy, you are really good about calling your clients, letting them know what's happening with the case, keeping them informed every step of the way. Because what you got to remember is that these clients, this is their first case a lot of times. They've never been through this before. They don't know what to expect. Am I, am I doing the right thing? Am I getting the right medical treatment? Am I actually going to get a settlement at the end of the case? So they need that reassurance, and they need to know what the process is every step along the way. Welcome back to Come Back Stronger, where we are introducing you to Vivian Niebel, who was uh, a child raised in war-torn Berlin, and she has she's the author of An Unimportant Girl. That's the name of the book. It's being made into a documentary. Uh, we're going to uh, show you the second part of her interview right now. Vivian, thank you so much. I have a couple questions about the first half of your story. Um, I just want you to describe what it was like to feel hunger and hopelessness as such a young child. Um, you know, can you describe that for us? You know, since you're born in it, into it, 
it is uh, it's something that you kind of it, 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 it is something you deal with because you don't know any other you know life but you it makes you very resilient mm-hmm. and uh, i uh, always uh, went out and collected wooden boxes and scraps for food to for my mother to be able to make soup and, and make a fire so it made me very resourceful uh, and resilient and uh, but my mother did instill in us uh, always have a dream she always said have a dream and pointed out at the beauty of life and so it sounds like that's something that your husband tapped into when he started not only dreaming with you, but encouraging you to create dreams like running a marathon and becoming a pilot. Tell me a little bit about that. Well, I tell you, my husband had more, he more, he more, more believed in me. He had, uh, he saw potential in me because I didn't think I, I felt kind of unimportant and worthless. Mm-hmm. And that's why my documentary, you know, was called an unimportant, is called an unimportant girl because I felt very unimportant. My, my husband, taught me not just to live, but to thrive. It's so sad that you just felt unimportant. Yes, I felt so unimportant. But you know what, Gary? I don't regret, Have I have no regrets, even the challenges and the adverse situations that I had to go through. They made me what I am today. Mm, they right. made me resilient and uh, I'm very grateful. And I think my, my the, the, char- the character that would define me best would be Gratitude. Mm. I have a profound sense of gratitude for every small thing. And I think that is why I was, it, it molded me into this kind of person. You know what, Vivian, it sounds like your mother made you into the exact type of human being that she wanted you to be. Really? Exactly. Mm-hmm. With her, with her positivity and optimism, you get through this. And, uh, you know, th- that is very important that we tell our children they can succeed. They can be good. You know, it is, that's important. But it wasn't enough. There were so many strikes, one after another, yeah. that you start doubting. And then, of course, when, when once I married my hu- husband and he was so behind me, and that was amazing. And that is why I, I uh, wrote my first book, From Rubble to Champagne, which is my life story as a token of appreciation for my husband's 80th birthday to thank him for all he has done for me. And I think this is very important to always be grateful for the small or large things. It doesn't matter whether they're small or large, to be grateful for the helping hands that we get through in, in our life. And Vivian, you've been a, you've had cancer, right? You're a cancer survivor? Yes, later on, um, <clears throat> when I turned just about, I uh, was not quite 70, I was diagnosed with breast cancer. That was another uh, shock. No, but and that changes you as well, because you have a completely different outlook on life. You you understand the preciousness of of life, mm-hmm. of this gift of life. You know that that is amazing, and you live with more awareness. You know, and all the challenges that we that we go through. You know, they uh, they make us more aware and more appreciative. Absolutely. Vivian, for people that aren't used to having gratitude at the forefront of their minds, you know, maybe they're teenagers or maybe they're people that have been through so many struggles that they can't find the positive and all of that. How would you teach somebody to feel gratitude or focus on gratitude? Gratitude is really, it starts also being uh, <clears throat> optimistic and positive because when you are grateful for the smallest of things, first of all, ask yourself, you, you set your table and you have your loaf of bread. Be grateful for that because look at the world around you. You know, mm-hmm. there are so many people that, that go without it. Everything is a gift, you know, that we can yeah. we, we, we get. In, 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 in Food is a big deal to me. Bread is a big deal to me. Even though now I live in luxury, I will never forget where I came from. The, all this <clears throat> These experiences kept me grounded in reality. But I'd say to them, nothing, we should take nothing for granted. Because what if that is taken away from you? You know, imagine, imagine you take a shower, imagine all of a sudden there's no more warm water coming out. Mm-hmm. You know, mm-hmm. imagine yourself without those things. And then be grateful for what you have. Because when you're grateful, 
all the negative emotions are replaced with positive ones. That's a beautiful thing to say. And I know something that I learned to do with my own children is express our gratitude. So when you say, I'm so grateful for this bread, or I'm so great, you know, and every day do a different gratitude, it kind of trains your brain yes. to see that when you express Absolutely. it verbally. Mm -hmm. Yes, mm -hmm. yes. You, uh, you, you had, it, it is a mindset. You play the right thoughts in your mind. <clears throat> it's a mindset. And it's not just saying things, live by it. You know, yeah. when we... When we learn things, we need to apply them. Like I've studied the wisdom of the great minds of the philosophers and teachers, and I applied it into my life because it's not enough just knowing about it. We need to apply it in our life. Did you ever find the, the little six-year-old girl that prevented you from taking your life? No, not at all. And, you know, I was so young and so <clears throat> focused on just, you know, get out of this and it didn't give it that much more thought. Uh, only later on, as I became, <clears throat> I always thought it was it was incredible that that happened, but it, it actually uh, came to me later on in life when I became so successful that I said, my gosh, this was not uh, fortuitous. This, this was karmic. You know, mm. there was something about this. It was meant to be. I was meant to be here for a reason and i feel my reason is really to help others that feel suppressed and defeated this is my gift back to society well i'm so grateful that you've been on the show today vivian from a, a little girl growing up on the streets of decimated berlin to becoming a pilot and surviving cancer and you know writing your books and your documentary i just i'm fascinated with you and i'm so glad that you took your time to spend with us this afternoon thank you I thank you so much for having me. First of all, I want to say this, mm -hmm. that they've used the term illegitimate child, illegitimate child. Yeah. I want anybody to know if whether you grew up without a father or without a mother, you are legitimate. <laughs> you are human. important. Yes. You matter. That term, it just I, it, it makes me angry. Yeah. So but the other thing I want to say is that this woman is so wise and her what, ha what has happened is she, her her pain has turned into wisdom and she has ultimately said the most important thing is that the struggles that I went through have made me what I am today absolutely and I am now 53 years old I've experienced that in my own life mm -hmm. and I think that is one of the most important things that we as human beings can understand yeah and she's using it now and, and she's uh, you, know, you always talk about taking your pain and turning it into purpose and she says that's you know that's what I'm here for I'm here to help people and and uh, yeah. help people who started out feeling defeated and like they don't matter but I like what she said about profound gratitude because mm. I, I find that anytime yeah. anybody's feeling down about their situation usually if you look around do a quick inventory you have so much more yeah. to be grateful for than you realize and I think she makes that a part of her uh, you know daily probably you know motivational speak 100% and so what what I love the other thing that I love about her is that she is on a mission yeah. she has decided that the challenges that she went through were for a purpose mm -hmm. and that has created her mission to help others who feel depressed and deflated yeah. Right. That is exactly the key, the key elements to a great comeback story is you go through struggles, you overcome the struggles and then you come back and you help, help others else. who have are going through the same thing you had to go through. Yeah, I love it. All right. Well, we're going to go to a commercial break and come back. We still have a lot more to talk about. Tony, Jimmy and Kelly took what was a scary and horrible experience and turned it into a positive situation. Once these three jumped on our team, we were able to leave the legal part of the process to them and concentrate on our healing. You will always come back stronger with Basic Brooks on your side. The insurance company made us go one month before trial until they finally paid the money they were supposed to a year earlier. Not oh, yeah. Not the uncommon. reason why they paid the money is because they knew we were ready, willing, and able to go to trial. Insurance companies aren't paying out of the kindness of their hearts. Right. They're paying now because they think if they don't pay now, they may have to pay more later, right? And so we showed them that we had the evidence together, we had our witnesses set up, we had the doctors, their depositions were already scheduled, and they knew we were gonna go to trial, and that's when they finally became reasonable. That happens all the time. 
Welcome back to Come Back Stronger, where we just heard the story of Vivian Niebel, who was a child in war-torn Germany uh, in the wake of World War II, mm -hmm. and she um, she ended up going through some very serious challenges and struggles and come, coming back stronger. She ended up writing a book called An Unimportant Girl, and now there's being a documentary named after her. What was your biggest takeaway, Dana? I think I liked um, hearing that despite everything that they were dealing with, first fleeing her, her country, going to another country, um, her mother always reminded her to always have a dream. Always have a um, dream. Yeah, and I, I hear so many mm -hmm. stories about this. Whenever you uh, review you know, historians or, or you, you look at historical um, accountings of people who've had to overcome things, flee, flee war-torn countries or mm -hmm. um, you know, Underground Railroad, whatever it is, these people, they always have to have some view in their minds mm -hmm. of what they're they're doing all this mm -hmm. for. Yeah, mm -hmm. that has to look like something at the end of it. You know, is it freedom? Is it owning my own house? Is it being a free person? Whatever it is. But if you don't have a, a dream, you don't have hope. And if you don't have the hope, you, it's very hard to have the optimism. And that's what she says you need to do to replace all those bad things that come so naturally to some people. 100%. Life belongs to the dreamers. Yeah. Life belongs to the dreamers. But the good news is everybody can have a dream. Everybody can have a dream. When you hold on to that dream, one of the things I always encourage people to do is to have a dream, to be very specific about yes, the dream. you always say that. I say create a master goal yeah. and then think about that dream all the time. Yeah. Make that your motivating force. And that, to me, has been a life changer for me. And that yeah. seems like what she's done with her dream of helping others to feel, others who feel depressed and deflated, helping them overcome their challenges. And she, and she does it, you know, again, through the gratitude. You know, I, yes. I told uh, Jimmy when we were talking yeah. about this show before we started seeing the, the features part of it, I said, you know, I see this part where she she shows such gratitude for her husband. Yeah. You know, you don't always see people yeah. speak about their spouses, mm -hmm. you know, that way, but gosh, what a 60 year marriage, I think. One of the uh, best she quotes. Just, she just said he believed in me and then I believed in myself and we all need somebody like that in our lives. So she's very fortunate to have it. Take nothing for granted. And we will see you next week with another awesome comeback story. Thank you so much for joining us, everybody. That's the meaning of coming back stronger after an auto accident or a trucking accident. That's what it means to come back stronger. We are able to take somebody who has suffered such a horrible loss and have their lives turned upside down and we are able to do everything that is humanly possible to make up for what they lost to the greatest extent possible with money. We can look back and see how the money we were able to get our clients actually changed their lives, changed their lives and their children's lives. It is absolutely fascinating. I've seen clients that have gotten houses with the money that we got them. I've seen them build businesses with the money that we've got them through a settlement and have completely turned their lives around after their lives had already been turned upside down by somebody else's carelessness.